Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Tuatara are reptiles endemic to New Zealand. Although resembling lizards, they are part of a distinct lineage, the order Rhynchocephalia. Their name derives from the Maori language and means peaks on the back. The single species of Tuatara is the sole surviving member of its order, which originated in the Triassic period around 240 million years ago and which flourished during the Mesozoic era. Their most recent common ancestor with any other extant group is with the squamates, the lizards and snakes. Tuatara are greenish brown and grey, and measure up to 80 centimetres from head to tail tip, and weigh up to 1.3 kilograms, with a spiny crest along the back, which is especially pronounced in males. They have two rows of teeth in the upper jaw, overlapping one row on the lower jaw, which is unique among living species. The origin of the Tuatara probably lies close to the split between the Lepidosauromorpha and Archosauromorpha, way back in the early Triassic or late Permian. Though Tuatara resemble lizards, the similarity is very superficial, because the family has several characteristics unique among reptiles. Tuatara were initially classified as lizards in 1831, when the British Museum received a skull. The genus remained misclassified until 1867, when Albert Gunther of the British Museum also noted features similar to birds, turtles and crocodiles. He proposed the order Rhynchocephalia, meaning beakheads, for the Tuatara and their fossil relatives. Tuataras have been referred to as living fossils, due to a perception that they retain many basal characteristics from around the time of the squamate rhynchocephalian split 240 million years ago. Morphometric analysis of variations in jaw morphology among Tuatara and extinct rhynchocephalian relatives have been argued to demonstrate morphological conservatism, but the reliability of these results has been criticised by paleontologists. Further research on rhynchocephalians indicates that the group has undergone a variety of changes throughout the Mesozoic, and the rate of molecular evolution for Tuataras has been estimated to be among the fastest of any animal yet examined. Many of the niches occupied by lizards today were then held by Rhynchocephalians. There were even a successful aquatic group of these animals known as Pleurosaurs, which differed markedly from the living genus Sphenodon. Tuatara show cold weather adaptations, which allow them to thrive on the islands of New Zealand. These adaptations may be unique to the Tuatara, since their ancestors lived in the much warmer climates of the Mesozoic. For instance, Paleopleurosaurus appears to have had a much shorter lifespan compared to the modern genus Sphenodon. Ultimately, most scientists consider the phrase living fossil to be unhelpful and misleading. A species of Sphenodontid is known from the Miocene St. Bathans fauna of New Zealand, but whether it is referable to Sphenodon proper is not entirely clear, but it is most likely to be a close relative of the Tuatara. While there is currently considered to be only one living species of this animal, two species were previously identified, Sphenodon punctatus, or the northern Tuatara, and the much rarer Sphenodon guntheri, or Brothers Island Tuatara, which is confined to North Brother Island in the Cook Strait. The specific name Punctatus is Latin for spotted, and guntheri refers to the German-born British herpetologist Albert Gunther. The Tuatara is considered the most unspecialised living amniote. The brain and mode of locomotion resemble those of amphibians, and the heart is more primitive than any other reptile. The animals are sexually dimorphic, with males being larger than females. Adult Sphenodon punctatus males measure 61 cm in length, and females 45 cm. The San Diego Zoo cites an even higher length of up to 80 cm. Males weigh up to about a kilogram, and females up to half a kilogram. The Tuataras on Brothers Island are slightly smaller, weighing up to 660 grams. The Tuatara's greenish-brown colour matches its environment well, and can change slowly over its lifetime. The animals shed their skin at least once per year as adults, and three to four times a year as juveniles. The sexes also differ in more than just size. The spiny crest on a Tuatara's back, made of triangular, soft folds of skin, 
is larger in males and can be stiffened for use in display. The tip of the upper jaw is beak-like and separated from the remainder of the jaw by a notch. There is a single row of teeth in the lower jaw and a double row in the upper with the bottom row fitting perfectly between the two upper rows when the mouth is closed. This specific tooth arrangement is not seen in any other reptile. The structure of the jaw joint allows the lower jaw to slide forwards after it has closed between the two upper rows of teeth. This mechanism allows the jaws to shear through chitin and bone, giving the tuatara a powerful and painful bite. Fossils indicate that this jaw mechanism began evolving at least 200 million years ago. The teeth are not replaced, and as their teeth wear down, older tuatara have to switch to softer prey such as earthworms, larvae and slugs, and eventually have to chew their food between smooth jaw bones. It is a common misconception that tuatara do not have teeth, and instead have sharp projections of the jaw bone. However, the tooth-like structures are indeed teeth. Histology shows that they are made of enamel and dentine, and that they have pulp cavities, as we would expect. The tuatara has a third eye on top of its head, called the parietal eye. It has its own lens, a parietal plug which resembles a cornea, retina with rod-like structures, and a degenerated nerve connection to the brain. The parietal eye is visible only in hatchlings, which have a translucent patch at the top of their skull. After four to six months, it becomes covered by opaque scales and pigment. Its purpose is not certain, but it may be useful in absorbing ultraviolet rays to produce vitamin D, as well as to determine light dark cycles and help with thermoregulation. Together with turtles, the tuatara has the most primitive hearing organs among amniotes. There is no eardrum and no ear hole. They lack a tympanum, and the middle ear cavity is filled with loose tissue mostly fatty adipose tissue. Though the hearing organs are poorly developed and primitive with no external ears, they can still show a frequency response from 100 to 800 hertz, with peak sensitivity at 40 to 200 hertz. Adult tuatara are terrestrial and nocturnal reptiles, though they will often bask in the sun to warm their bodies. Hatchlings hide under rocks and logs, and are diurnal, likely because adults are cannibalistic. Tuatara thrive in temperatures much lower than those tolerated by most reptiles, and hibernate during the winter. They remain active at temperatures as low as 5 degrees. While temperatures of over 28 degrees are generally fatal, the optimal body temperature for the Tuatara is from 16 to 21 degrees Celsius, the lowest of any reptile. This lower body temperature results in a slower metabolism. Their diets also consist of frogs, lizards, birds' eggs and chicks. The eggs and young of seabirds that are seasonably available as food for tuatara may also provide beneficial fatty acids. Tuatara of both sexes defend territories and will threaten and eventually bite intruders. These reptiles reproduce very slowly, taking 10 to 20 years to reach sexual maturity. Mating occurs in midsummer. Females mate and lay eggs once every four years. During courtship, a male makes his skin darker, raised his crests and parades towards the female. He slowly walks in circles around her with stiffened legs. The female will either submit, allowing the male to mount her, or retreat to her burrow. Males do not have a penis. Instead, they have a rudimentary hemipenis, meaning that intermittent organs are used to deliver sperm to the female during copulation. They reproduce by the male lifting the tail of the female and placing his vent over hers. This process is sometimes referred to as a cloacal kiss. The sperm is then transferred into the female, much like the mating process in birds. Along with birds, the tuatara is one of the only members of amniota to have lost the ancestral penis. Wild tuatara are known to be still reproducing at about 60 years of age or more. Henry, a male tuatara at Southland Museum in Invercargill, New Zealand, became a father, possibly for the first time, on the 23rd of January 2009, at the age of 111. The sex of a hatchling depends on the temperature of the egg, with warmer eggs tending to produce male tuataras, and the cooler eggs producing females. 
Some experts believe that captive Tuatara could live as long as 200 years. The reptiles were once widespread on New Zealand's main north and south islands, where sub-fossil remains have been found in sand dunes, caves and in Maori middens. Wiped out from the main islands before European settlement, they were long confined to 32 offshore islands free of mammals. The islands are difficult to get to, and are colonised by few animal species, indicating that some animals absent from these islands may have caused the Tuatara to disappear from the mainland. However, Polynesian rats had recently become established on several of the islands, and Tuatara were persisting, but not breeding, on these islands. Additionally, Tuatara were much rarer on the rat-inhabited islands. Prior to conservation work, 25% of the distinct Tuatara population had become extinct in the past century. The recent discovery of a Tuatara hatchling on the mainland indicates that attempts to re-establish a breeding population on the New Zealand mainland have had some success. The total population of Tuatara is estimated to be greater than 60,000, but less than 100,000. The animals were removed from Stanley, Red Mercury and Cuvier Island in 1990 and 1991, and maintained in captivity to allow the Polynesian rats to be eradicated on those islands. All three populations bred in captivity, and after successful eradication of the rats, all individuals, including new juveniles, were returned to their islands of origin. Tuatara feature in a number of indigenous legends, and are held as ariki, meaning god forms. Tuatara are regarded as messengers of Wiro, the god of death and disaster, and Maori women are forbidden to eat them. Today, Tuatara are regarded as a taonga, meaning special treasure. Despite being the only representative of its order alive today, Rhynchocephalia was far more diverse and widespread in the past, with a fossil record stretching back to the Middle Triassic. Many of the niches occupied by lizards today were held by these animals during the Triassic and Jurassic, although lizard diversity began to overtake Sphenodontian diversity in the Cretaceous. While the modern Tuatara is primarily carnivorous, there were also rhynchocephalians with omnivorous, herbivorous and durophagous lifestyles. There were even several successful groups of aquatic Sphenodontians, such as Pleurosaurs and Ankylosphenodon. The oldest and most basal rhynchocephalians were members of a family known as Gephrosauridae, recovered from Triassic and early Jurassic rocks of the United Kingdom, Italy and Switzerland. Of these, the genus Gephrosaurus is the best known, a small and vaguely Tuatara-like insectivore that used a patient feeding strategy as it waited for prey to arrive. High incidence of jaw fractures found among specimens infers that this animal was potentially territorial and would attack those that crossed into their home range. Other basal rhynchocephalians were generally quite similar in appearance. Diphydontosaurus from the late Triassic of Italy and the UK was far smaller than the modern Tuatara, measuring only 10 centimetres long and fed on insects. Homeosaurus from Bavaria was a slender and graceful animal, indicating an active insectivorous lifestyle. While the genus Clevosaurus was incredibly similar to Sphenodon in almost all skeletal details except for the teeth, these were blunt and leaf-shaped, suggesting a diet that included plants as well as small animals. Clevosaurus possessed a very wide distribution, with fossils recovered from the UK, Canada, China and Brazil. The latter Brazilian Clevosaurus haprotodon was only named in 2019, and represents the oldest known rhynchocephalian from Gondwana. Another lineage moved away from the land and ventured into the warm waters of Jurassic Europe, the Pleurosaurids. Paleopleurosaurus was the most basal of this group, and showed only moderate adaptations for a marine existence. As their remains are known from Lagerstaten deposits, the biology and physiology of this animal is well known thanks to a number of spectacularly preserved fossils. Histological studies have suggested that this genus possessed a much shorter lifespan than the modern Tuatara, suggesting a higher metabolism and a more active lifestyle. Its more derived relative Pleurosaurus was better adapted for life in the shallow seas of Jurassic Bavaria, with a long whip-like tail and an elongated eel-like body. In all, the animal measured up to 1.5 metres long 
and would have been able to swim rapidly by undulating its slender body in a snake-like fashion. It had only small limbs, which probably did not aid in swimming, and had nostrils placed far back on the head, close to the eyes. Then we come to the family Sphenodontidae, the group to which the Tuatara belongs. First originating in the early Jurassic, nine genera have been named and were rather diverse in terms of appearance and ecological niche. Interestingly, seven of these have been recovered from the Jurassic and early Cretaceous deposits in Mexico, although why these reptiles were so commonplace there is something of a mystery. In addition to this, recent phylogenetic studies have shown that the Tuatara is the most basal member of this family, which suggests a long ghost lineage in Gondwana leading back to the early Jurassic. Unlike the generalistic carnivorous Sphenodon, ancient genera inhabited a number of more specialised niches, such as the semi-aquatic herbivorous Ankylosphenodon with ever-growing teeth, the Durophagus oenosaurus, and the possibly venomous Sphenovipera. The sister lineage to Sphenodontidae is known as Opisthodontia, and contains many herbivorous forms. They first appeared in the late Triassic and survived the KPG extinction event, living until at least the late Paleocene. In terms of distribution, these animals were primarily native to the Americas, with the oldest member, Sphenotitan, being recovered from late Triassic deposits of Argentina. Like other rhynchocephalians, opisthodonts had acrodont teeth, which grew directly from the bone. They had one row of teeth in the lower jaw and two rows on the roof of the mouth. Opisthodont teeth were wide, numerous, and tightly packed for grinding and shredding tough plant matter. Although wide, shredding teeth are also known in a few other Sphenodontians, such as Clevosaurus and Pelicimala, the most diverse and long-lasting group of herbivorous rhynchocephalians were the opisthodonts. Some more generalised forms, such as Opistheas, were generally more capable of omnivory than the more advanced and derived Ilenodonts. Opisthodonts lacked dental regionalization, meaning that all of their teeth had the same form and they did not have the caniniform or hatchling teeth like other sphenodonts. Despite having thicker enamel to resist wearing down their teeth, these animals have often been found with their teeth significantly worn away, especially towards the front of the jaw. The tip of the lower jaw is completely toothless. Their jaws are also deep, especially in Ilenodonts, to counter stresses which would have occurred during food processing. The derived Ilenodontines were large, stocky and heavily built members of the clade, with massive jaws, low and overlapping teeth, and a large hooked false beak at the front of their jaws. Their skulls were reminiscent of rodents in some ways, leading some to presume that they were gregarious burrowers which fed on tough vegetation. The largest known terrestrial rhynchocephalian was an Ilenodont, Priosphenodon avalasi, perhaps up to a metre long. Some of these animals, such as Opistheas and Ilenodon itself, were inhabitants of the famous Late Jurassic Morrison Formation, and were contemporaries of dinosaurs such as Allosaurus, Diplodocus and Stegosaurus. In general, South America was the stronghold of this group, where most genera have been found. The very last of these animals, Cowasphenodon from the Paleocene, was also found here, and the entire group likely went extinct during the late Eocene. Fortunately, the genus Sphenodon was able to survive in isolation on Zealandia across the Cenozoic and into modern times, being the last rhynchocephalian on Earth. Let us hope that the conservation efforts can finally allow these special animals to return to the mainland after many centuries of exile by humans and other invasive species. Thanks for watching everyone. Next week I'll be covering the Charistoderans, mysterious semi-aquatic reptiles that may or may not be archosauromorphs. See you again soon. Cheerio.